All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining the Delaware uh, Clean Slate Delaware campaign launch event. We are really excited to be here with you all today. Um, just going to go going to go over a few quick housekeeping things before we jump into the webinar and uh, and get started with Rebecca Vallis. I will start by just letting everyone here know that this webinar is being recorded and live streamed on Facebook. If you're watching us on Facebook, please share it uh, so that we can help spread the word and other people can tune in. We aren't doing a question and answer for this event, so the Q&A feature is disabled, but we have the chat active. So if you're here in our Zoom event, please comment, let us know where you're tuning in from, why you're here, why you care about the Clean Slate Initiative. If you're watching on Facebook, please do the same in the comments. Um, and for media who are joining us today, we invite you to join us for a, a debrief event in a separate Zoom after this launch event. If you didn't get the link from the media advisory, private chat me or shoot me an email and I will get you that link. I'm now gonna go ahead and hand this off to Rebecca Vallis to get this event rolling. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much, Morgan. Um, and hello to everyone in cyberspace who's joining us for the launch of the Clean Slate Delaware campaign today. My name is Rebecca Vallis. I'm a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress in Washington, and I'm one of the co-founders of the Clean Slate Initiative. It is also my distinct pleasure on this Wednesday morning to welcome you to probably your 18th Zoom of the day. And I recognize it's only 11 a.m. on the East Coast. So really do appreciate everyone for joining us. Um, more seriously, it is, it is my great honor to moderate a, a true powerhouse lineup today of Delawarean leaders who are working to ensure that a criminal record is no longer a, a life sentence to poverty and a topic that is more important now than ever. There are just so many ways that COVID-19 has laid bare all the things that are broken about the U.S. public policy landscape. And one way that America has long been exceptional, of course, is our broken criminal justice system. On top of mass incarceration and over-criminalization, one key feature of the U.S. system that makes us exceptional and not in the good way is that the stigma of a criminal record can follow someone for long after they've completed their sentence, sometimes for life, preventing them from really ever having a shot at a quote second chance. Because of this, it's sometimes said that a criminal record can be a life sentence to poverty that no judge ever handed down. Some others call it a paper prison. Red, blue, and purple states alike across the US have been making important strides in recent years to free their people from these paper prisons and ensure that people with records are able to access jobs and housing and education so that they can provide for their families and, and truly rebuild their lives. Among the most important and promising recent trends is the bipartisan momentum in the states for expanding access to criminal record clearing through remedies like expungement and sealing. Over half the states, including the great state of Delaware, have expanded their record clearing laws in recent years and many on a bipartisan basis. Now to ensure that people are able to get their records cleared, whether or not they're able to afford to hire a lawyer and navigate a complex and often Byzantine court process, a growing number of states are taking steps to make record clearing automatic. And many are taking up a policy model that's come to be known as Clean Slate. Clean Slate harnesses automation to clear qualifying criminal records for people who have completed their sentence and remained crime free. Pennsylvania became the first state to enact a clean slate automated record clearing law in 2018. And in the first year of implementation, Pennsylvania sealed over 36 million cases, helping to clear records for over a million Pennsylvanians. Utah became the second state to enact a clean slate law in 2019. And Michigan soon followed suit, enacting what is now the most expansive clean slate law in the country in October 2020. And that bipartisan momentum is only growing. Just this past week, Texas, Oregon, and New York York announced the launch of Clean Slate campaigns in their states, joining North Carolina, Louisiana, Connecticut, New Jersey, and several others already advancing Clean Slate measures. And I'm especially thrilled to see Delaware join their ranks today with the launch of a Clean Slate campaign, thanks to the incredible leadership of Senator Darius Brown, uh, ACLU of Delaware, and a range of other folks that you'll get to hear from in just a bit. The bipartisan momentum for second chance policies like Clean Slate could not come at a more critical moment. 
And that's because while millions of American families are now struggling mightily amid the recession spurred by the COVID pandemic, workers facing the stigma of a record were already facing a permanent recession of their own long before COVID hit our shores. Prior to the pandemic, formerly incarcerated people were already facing an unemployment rate of nearly 27%. That's higher than any US employment rate at any time, including during the Great Depression. So as we work to rebuild the nation's economy, policies like Clean Slate that remove barriers to employment for people with records will be absolutely essential to ensure a fair, full, and equitable recovery that doesn't leave behind tens of millions of justice-impacted individuals and families. And that's the goal of the Clean Slate Initiative nationally, which is proud to be supporting today's event and the Delaware Clean Slate campaign. So with that, it is my honor to introduce our first speaker today, one of a, my good friends and a, a national leader on these issues, Delaware Congresswoman Lisa Blount Rochester. Her entire career has been devoted to helping people connect with jobs and creating opportunities for the people that she serves. Congresswoman Blount Rochester is leading the charge on Clean Slate at the federal level, where Congress is quite literally learning from the states as we speak on the importance of record clearing to economic opportunity and to recovery. Congresswoman, thank you so, so much for being with us today and for your leadership on Clean Slate. And please kick us off. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Uh, first, I just want to thank you not only for the introduction, but for your steadfast dedication to speaking up. And I have seen you speak up on many, many issues that affect people, particularly people that sometimes felt unheard and unseen. So I thank you so much, Rebecca, for all of your work. Um, it's been a pleasure for me to work with you and everyone at the Center for American Progress on this initi initiative, as well as others um, surrounding equity and justice. Um, I started working with uh, you guys as soon as I entered Congress four years ago, and I'm glad we're still uh, working together. And to everyone at the ACLU and all of the partner organizations, I want to thank you so much for hosting this event to launch the Delaware Clean Slate campaign. Um, that, that makes me feel proud. I, I'm, I'm going to say it again. Today we are launching the Delaware Clean Slate campaign. And I have to, you know, echo what Rebecca said that, you know, it's challenging enough um, under normal circumstances, but during a pandemic, we know how important Clean Slate really is. And as, as your former Secretary of Labor, I understand all too well the barriers to employment that justice involved individuals face. And in the midst of a pandemic, when workforces have been shrinking and payrolls stretched, justice involved individuals are too often the first ones fired as the workforce recovers, sometimes the last ones hired. And when our loved ones, our neighbors, our friends are barred from fully participating in our society, we all lose out. It's by some accounts, the economic impact that is lost is approximately $80 billion in gross domestic product. But it's not just the money, and it's not just the morality of it. Like many of you, I know that um, this is personal, that we've seen the struggles that those that are trying to return face to fully integrate back into society. For me, I think every time I think about Clean Slate, I am reminded of my cousin um, who went, uh, went to prison, came out while, was, while he was there, learned trades, was so excited and came back home and could not get a job. Um, ended up falling back into the life and was murdered. There are stories like that then and there are stories of individuals now who have served their time and are just asking for a clean slate. There are also success stories and stories that we will hear about today that show the importance of this. And that's why it has been a priority of mine throughout my tenure in Washington to create the first of its kind federal record clearing remedy. We know that as many as one in three Americans have a criminal record and that criminal records can create a lifelong barrier to employment, education, and housing. Nine out of 10 employers 
conduct background checks. Four out of five landlords conduct background checks and three out of five colleges conduct background checks. The Clean Slate Initiative at both the state and federal level is all about a simple proposition that those who have served their time and paid their debt to society deserve a fair shot at a second chance and a clean slate. And it's not even a partisan issue. I, I, I've worked with people on, on this bill. I sometimes call it my strange bedfellows bill because it's people from all, all different backgrounds, all political persuasions that have worked with me on clean slate. And this work is paramount not just to us as legislators, but to many organizations from think tanks like CAP to the business community. That's why I'm so excited that State Senator Darius Brown has taken up this mantle right here in Delaware. After all, it was Congress drawing on the inspiration from the states that led us to introduce Clean Slate at the federal level. And I can think of no one better or more capable than to lead this initiative in Delaware than Senator Brown. As the leader of the Black Caucus in our state house, and as the leader of some truly groundbreaking criminal justice reforms in Dover, I know that Clean Slate is in good hands with Senator Brown. In the meantime, I'm working every day here in Washington, not only to pass Clean Slate at the federal level, but to provide financial support through the appropriations process. By appropriations process, I mean the money process for clean slate programs across the country. So Darius, we need you and your colleagues to send clean slate to Governor Carney's desk as soon as possible. And with that, it is now my honor and my turn to turn it over to my good friend, the chairman of the Delaware Legislative Black Caucus, the primary sponsor of an adult expungement bill that expanded access to second chances for Delawareans with a record, and who continues to advocate for justice reform in the first state. The distinguished gentleman from Delaware's second senatorial district, Senator Darius Brown. Thank you, Congresswoman. It is always good uh, to be with you uh, and definitely to continue to follow and work with you on such groundbreaking legislation that creates opportunities for Delawareans from Claymont to Del Mar. As we talk about Clean Slate, it's important to recognize the partnerships that we have locally and nationally. And so thankful to Rebecca and the Center for American Progress and the friendship that we have had for almost a decade now um, since Progress 2050 uh, kicked off. A lot of those root causes uh, of systemic poverty, we found, we find we are still addressing here with the Clean Slate legislation. We wanna ensure opportunity for people to have access to employment, housing, and jobs. By doing that, we create pathways out of poverty through education, and employment and ultimately upward mobility for individuals to provide for themselves and their families. Two years ago, we passed the adult expungement bill, which was an historic and groundbreaking bill here in the state of Delaware and arguably one of the most exhaustive and comprehensive criminal justice reform bills in the country. In, in sponsoring the bill, we had support in Delaware State Senate for unanimous passage of every Democrat and every Republican supporting this bill. As chairman of the Delaware Senate Judiciary Committee, I look forward to continuing the progress that we made in the passage of the adult expungement bill with now sponsoring the ultimate passage of the Clean Slate Act. We have corporate support, union support, and most importantly, community support to ensure that this bill has the added voices that are necessary for everyone that, that we represent to be heard. The automatic clean slate process creates greater equity, consistency, and cost effectiveness through a streamlined clearance process that applies to all eligible records, regardless of a person's race, and more importantly, regardless of a person's wealth. 
The clean slate policy model empowers Delawareans to automatically seal or expunge qualifying criminal records for people who remain crime free and for a set period of time. When a criminal record is sealed or expunged, it no longer shows up on background checks and individuals can legally answer the question no when asked if they have been convicted of a crime. This allows individuals to have paid their debt to society and to access employment, housing, education, and opportunity. Beyond automating the record clearing process, the Clean Slate Initiative model also works to expand eligibility so that more Delawareans are able to receive a second chance. I can think of no better voice or greater voice in our faith community that not only understands the grace of second chances, but preaches and lives out that example to his congregation and community. Then the Honorable Reverend Dr. Sylvester Scott Beeman pastor of the Bethel AME Church. He is the president's pastor and he continues to pray for all of us. It is my honor that our faith community is represented today through this great leader, Reverend Dr. Sylvester Scott Beaton. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Darius, for that introduction and to Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester. As most of you know, on uh, January 3rd, um, the then President-elect Joseph R. Biden gave me a call that late Sunday night and said, would I, would I be available to, to pronounce the benediction at the inaugural, for which I was humbly honored. Um, and in that prayer, um, I kind of poured myself and what I stand for and what's core to my um, spiritual and faith beliefs and development. I believe that though we may not all share the same religion, we do share a common faith. And in our various faith orientations, there is a, a strong commitment to justice. And so I prayed in that prayer that we would discover our common humanity when we discover our role in God or in our faith. And I said uh, in uh, that, um, second paragraph, in discovering our humanity, we will seek the good in and for all our neighbors, all our neighbors. We will love the unlovable, remove the stigma of the so-called untouchables. We will care for our most vulnerable, our children, elderly, and emotionally challenged, and the poor. And here's the point. We will seek rehabilitation beyond correction. We will extend opportunities to those locked out of opportunity and we'll make friends of our enemies. A lot of that uh, was uh, birthed in me and my spirit uh, about this so whole subject of having a clean sleep. Um, the, the book of Michelle Alexander, the new Jim Crow, Ava DuVernay's uh, the 13th Amendment, pastoring uh, members uh, who I had to go down to Dover to have their records expunged and so on and so forth was feeding into me at the time that I sat pen to paper and wrote this benediction. Uh, we, we, when we find our humanity, we really do find a spirit where uh, we seek something beyond correction, something beyond punishment. If someone breaks the law and uh, they are incarcerated, that should not be uh, a death sentence or uh, shackles for the, their entire life. Michelle Alexander calls it the new Jim Crow. Or as we saw in the 13th uh, um, the, the documentary, uh, so many lives ruined and generations of lives ruined because of a system that is more bent on punishment than on uh, rehabilitation, even the word correction for so many places, it's just another word for punishment. But when we seek rehabilitation, we really are seeking to give persons their humanity back, their personhood back, and giving them an opportunity to participate in the fullness of 
their constitutional rights or their human rights, I should say, uh, which to me supersede the constitutional rights, but should inform the constitutional rights. And so my brothers uh, and sisters, um, I, I want to urge all faith perspectives to get on board with this because we worship and praise the God of another chance. If God has the capacity to forgive us of our wrongdoings and even proclivities and set us on a street called straight, then everyone should be given an opportunity to have a clean slate and to start all over again. Because when that happens, we do. Uh, we open up opportunities to those who have had the doors of opportunities sh uh, slammed shut behind them. And I can give you numerous examples, and I'll just give you one. I won't call the name of the individual, um, but I can tell you this. Um, when he was younger, he had some issues. And having those issues, he did some wrong. And who among us when we were young didn't do some wrong? He went to prison. He served his time. Once he finished, he was, uh, went into a 12-step program. In that 12-step program, uh, he got clean. He went to the University of Delaware, graduate honors, then went on to the University of Pennsylvania, an Ivy League school, graduate honors. And today he is employed by the state of Pennsylvania, the city of Philadelphia, as a COVID-19 um, executive. executive. This man has proven that he learned his lesson, got clean, literally is in a 12 step program consistently and is now contributing to not only the state of Delaware, the city of Wilmington, Newcastle County, but he is contributing to the state of Pennsylvania and the city of Philadelphia. This man deserves a clean slate. As we talk right now, he doesn't have one. And so um, turning it back to Rebecca, that's, that's my contribution today that if I, I urge all faith communities to get behind Clean Slate Delaware. Thank you. Reverend, thank you so much for your powerful words and for your, your powerful words at the inauguration as well. It's it's um, really, really a privilege to have you here today and, and participating in this event. Um, and I mean, what you're what you're saying just really strikes such a chord because um, at its core, the, the, the concept of clean slate is about redemption. It's about making good on this nation's um, commitment to believing in, in the power of redemption, as opposed to throwing people away um, as disposable um, and and, and relegating them to a permanent underclass because of a single mistake, which is, is just not something that's in the values um, or should be in the values of, of this society. Um, and, and thank you, Senator um, Darius Brown um, for, uh, for your remarks as well. And I believe uh, uh, Congresswoman um, Blunt Rochester may have um, needed to leave us, but um, thank you to her as well in absentia. Um, we're gonna keep the program moving because we've got a number of additional leaders to hear from. Um, and I wanna make sure we've got time for, um, for everyone that we've got um, in today's roster. And so without further ado, um, I'm going to next introduce John Reynolds um, of the ACLU of Delaware. He is the new campaign manager for the Delaware Clean Slate campaign. Um, he comes to Clean Slate after working on state and local legislative campaigns and, and direct service efforts in New York. Um, he is a, a graduate of UCLA School of Law um, and an alum of its critical race specialization program, where he worked with formerly incarcerated people navigating California's record expungement process. Um, uh, and I should say um, he is uh, joining uh, this campaign literally today as it launches. And so we're going to be uh, welcoming him uh, with trial by fire on his first day as he uh, now takes up the, um, the mic next. Uh, John, over to you um, to talk a little bit more about this campaign. Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you, everyone. Uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure and a privilege to be here with my fellow panelists, as well as everybody out there in Zoom and Facebook land who are viewing from afar. I'm really excited to be part of this campaign. And uh, I'm gonna be very brief because I really, I'm excited to hear from our next group of speakers, the real true experts on this topic, folks who have navigated 
the collateral challenges faced by individuals with a criminal history in Delaware. So first, I'd like to introduce Corey Priest. Um, Corey is the engagement, the community engagement specialist for the Delaware Attorney General's office, is one of the first to have his felony conviction and criminal history expunged in the state of Delaware. Mr. Priest's personal and professional experiences in reentry lends itself to being an advocate and supporter of those who are affected by the many collateral consequences of criminal history. So I'll pass it over to Corey. So good morning, y'all. Uh, definitely, definitely uh, extremely happy to be a part of this panel. I have goosebumps, uh, literally. Uh, just, you know, uh, having an opportunity to tell my story, uh, the road to redemption, as Rebecca puts it, uh, for me coming home from incarceration a little less than 10 years ago, uh, it was frightening that I would be walking around with the scarlet letter F tattooed on my forehead. Um, a felony conviction is a weapon of mass destruction for economic growth and upward mobility for individuals who are affected by their criminal felony convictions. It was a weapon of mass destruction for me. So I had to navigate this life now uh, filled with having to explain myself everywhere I go uh, in terms of trying to get an education, housing, employment. And so it was a daunting task for me to now have to, to have to explain why I had this felony conviction. And so coming home, I knew I had to explain it. So I wanted to put myself in the best position to explain it to people who would understand. So I knew I had to find employment where they will forgive my crime. Right? I knew I couldn't work at the bank. I knew I couldn't work in a hospital at the time. I knew I had 792 collateral consequences associated with my felony conviction, 792. And that's from a ACLU report um, that was done several years ago. And so I knew I could get a pardon. And so that's what I strive for. You know, I was on my priest road to redemption. I was on a let me restore my dignity. Let me restore my life back. Let me associate myself with folks who uh, could understand why I, you know, I did what I did to land in jail. Um, and so my crime was trafficking marijuana. I was caught with a lot, a lot, a lot of marijuana and ultimately served a two year sentence, signed a plea for 30 months. Had I went to trial, I would have still been in jail, 11 years minimum mandatory. Now I work for the Department of Justice, the Attorney General's Office as a community engagement specialist. I was on my road to redemption, right? I wanted to associate myself with people who were on the same path as me, that were a little bit smarter than me, that were in, 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 in uh, situations in our lives that I can tell, I, I can tag on to where I knew where I wanted to go. I didn't know how I was gonna get there. I didn't know who I had to explain this felony conviction uh, to. And so it was time to go to school. I got a degree at Delaware Tech. And then it was time to go to the other school, <laughs> four year school, Wilmington University. The application process was, hey, have you been convicted of a felony? Yes, uh, we have to go through a, a lot of different uh, uh, systems and situations for us to approve for you to go to school. And really for me, I was about to give up. There's a point if I wanna just stick with this two year associate degree and give up, or do I see the course through? Or do I, do I, do I put my head down and be determined to get back into school uh, for my four year psycholo psychology degree? And so I figured it's not for me, I want to trailblaze for everybody else, right? And so I, I, I put my head down, I bust my butt to get into school. Got in, uh, finished school with a 3.93, I believe, 3.93, right? Uh, a B on my, a, a C, a C in one of my classes. It may have been a, <laughs> it may have been a, a, one of those math courses that was extremely hard, but anyway. And I saw it through and I was like, you know what? I'm doing this for the people, right? And so 
I got a pardon. And at the time, you couldn't get your felony convictions expunged until June 30th, 2019. Um, Senator Darius Brown introduced the legislation and it was signed into office 2019. June 30th, which was eight years to the day I came home from jail. I'm at Legislative Hall in tears because I know this is groundbreaking. I know this is, this is a piece of legislation that's gonna help hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people in the state of Delaware are affected by their criminal history. And so I had a chance to speak in front of hundreds of people, had no idea I was gonna shed tears, enjoyment. And so that's what I did. And then, my record was expunged uh, April of last year. And it was, the, it, was, it was like my second birthday. It was my second birthday because it allowed me to restore my dignity. It allowed me to restore my citizen, citizen, citizenry. It allowed me to be me. I didn't have to explain anything. And quite honestly, <laughs> Um, I'm gonna be in the papers and be everywhere. And you know, you Google my name, former felon. So it's not for me because anybody who I say, no, I'm not a convicted felon anymore will Google my name and see that I am or was, um, but it's for the people who are behind me. It's for the folks who are still sitting in our uh, Department of Correction facilities. It's for the folks who are sitting at home and can't get a job or can't go to school or, or afraid to, be interviewed for housing uh, because of their felony convictions. And I'm telling you, I support this legislation wholeheartedly without a blink of an eye that we need this clean slate legislation for the people who are um, affected by their criminal histories. And, you know, I read a quote that said, your felony conviction is a death penalty, is the death penalty for economic mobility. And so with that, with, with that being said, I'm extremely pleased that um, I am 100% behind this legislation. And anyone that knows me throughout the state of Delaware or wherever knows that I am for the people and I'm always advocate for the, breaking down these barriers of criminal history and felony conviction that will hinder your lives moving forward. So with that being said, I do wanna send it over to a brilliant young man and Donald Parkell, uh, who has a story that's gonna pull at the heartstrings of everyone who's listening. So Donald, take it away. Thank you, Corey. Um, I just wanna begin by touching on something that I don't think anybody thought of. Um, there's been a little mention of it by Corey and Darius, but it really, it all boils down to race. Um, these, these laws were designed to keep black people disenfranchised, in prison, unable to get the better jobs. I mean, we know it. The thing that exposed the cracks in it wasn't COVID, it was the pandemic of racism and George Floyd's unfortunate death is what was the catalyst. Um, I've done a lot of time in prison and I can honestly say that I haven't met many people who were truly bad. All of the assumptions about an inmate being incorrigible, dangerous to society. It's not true. These people are targeted and it is a geographical targeting. And to have the burden of the record ensures that they won't grow too far outside of Wilmington or outside of Newcastle. Um, we have an identity. 
we have a a a morality we all want to be good but then you know in certain interviews like between me and uh Claire and Mattias the 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 supposition from them the people that are not going to want this to succeed, they call us dangerous to society. When I was trying to advocate, I'm still am, I will not stop, for Tariq Downing's release, pardon, she said he was, in her response, that he was too dangerous because he had a write-up for misconduct and he didn't participate in certain programming. Like Corey said just a second ago, he would still be in prison if he didn't take the plea. It's systematic. It, it, it's built not because you're a danger, but it's built like let's make a deal. And in this deal, you are going to give away everything that you could possibly cherish because you don't know that these things are so valuable when you're young. Um, the hardships that we face when we get out, they, they cascade upon one another. We can't get a job at the most easiest place to get a job for anybody. We can't even work at Amazon. Um, so as of right now, as I sit here right now, I have five jobs. Um, Everybody wants to work. Everybody wants to have a good job. Everyone who wants to succeed and have the family proud. Even the inmates who are in jail right now because their plea bargain that was designed from these laws that ensured that racism would thrive in America is sitting there right now wishing that they could make their mom proud, wishing that they could spend their six-year-old daughter's birthday with that daughter. So we get out, all of these burdens exist, and it becomes impossible to navigate for someone without the proper rehabilitation inside the prison system. We're talking about a group of people that is because Delaware is such a small state, the, the group of people that we're trying to help with the Clean Slate Act is less than 6,000. This is not something that should be fought. The Clean Slate Act can actually help those who now have found a morality to stand up and claim that they are outraged by the racism that they did not recognize not too long ago. Everyone now is an advocate. And while that is welcomed, I really don't think it should take a public switch of importance to say that you now support this because you should have been supporting it a long time ago. Um, our voice is being recognized now. We are understanding our power. We are understanding that we actually hold the majority of the voter base. It is not the elite people. It is the lower to lower middle class people from Wilmington, Newcastle, Dover, Newark. We have an identity and our identity is strong and it should be respected. Look at the history of these laws. Look at the history of the authors of these laws and what they have supported in the past. These tough on crime bills to ensure that they could get elected, the campaign promises to lock everybody up for the rest of their life. These people supported a lot worse things than that. And it's not hard to see their record. Personally, the five jobs that I spoke about, I don't make that much money. Five jobs is just because 
I want to work. I want to succeed. But there's still these shackles that you just can't shake. And it doesn't matter what the, you know, the commissioner of the Department of Corrections, the mayor, the governor, it doesn't matter what they believe when they say, we can't do that for him, we can't do that for them. Because when you don't do it for them, all you're doing is ensuring in the future that when these people get released and have no options and all those cascading effects tumble upon each other, your refusal will be the nexus that caused another victim to be victimized. Recidivism is a word that loses the fact that there's a victim side to that. So anybody who goes back to prison has victimized somebody, most likely. We're not going back to prison for bank frauds and stuff. We're going back to prison for like interactions with other people that create a victim. Those victims don't have to even have experienced victimhood. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it off. I think I said enough. I don't want to take up too much time. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. Donald, thank you so much. And, and Corey, thank you so much for, for both sharing um, your just incredibly powerful um, uh, words and, um, and, and really speaking so much truth here. Um, just uh, thank you to both of you for, for taking the time to be part of this event today um, and, and for, for your words. Um, uh, we have a few more panelists that we're going to um, uh, continue to uh, move through. Um, uh, and so just to, to keep things moving, I'll be brief in, in my next introduction. Um, uh, one of the, um, uh, the constituencies who has also um, been vocally supporting Clean Slate and including in Delaware, as well as a number of the states that, that I mentioned before, um, is, is that of, um, of business and employers who are increasingly understanding um, that uh, this isn't just about helping workers find jobs, it's actually also a win-win for employers who are, are looking for, um, for, for skilled workers, many of whom are being um, uh, locked out of the workforce and um, in ways that, that are resounding with um, not just moral um, rot, but economic rot as well. Um, and so for that reason, um, a, a number of um, uh, employers within Delaware are supporting this campaign. Um, uh, and one in particular is, is here to, to speak with us today. That's Ronald Kumoko Harris um, of the International Longshoremen Association Local um, 1883, um, uh, and uh, Komoko um, was essential in developing the port expansion initiative that will create thousands of new good, uh, well-paying uh, union jobs and improve the lives of many here in the state, also supporting Clean Slate and, and going to speak a little bit about um, why, why there's an employer case here um, for, for doing the right thing um, uh, uh, and being the smart thing as well. Um, Komoko, um, I'm going to hand it over to you. We may be having technical difficulties. I'm confirming if that is the case. Komoko, I think you might be on mute. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Can you hear me? There you go. Go for it. You've got the floor. Okay. Um. I'm from the Port of Worms and I work at the Port of Worms and I'm, I'm, in, I'm a business agent for the International Law Insurance Association Local 1883. And what we do, the employer at the Port of Worms is Golf Tainer. Um, previous, previ previously it was the Diamond State Port Corporation. The union, what our job is, we supply the labor needs to the employer. And the Port of Wilmington has been for years, the Port of Wilmington and Local 199, let me say, for years has been like the only place where someone can come out of prison with a record and get a good paying union job, you know? And just to show you, give you an example of what the Port of Wilmington has meant, the Port of Women accounts for hundreds of jobs for African American in the in the Black community in Wilmington and Newcastle County. The Port of Wilmington has been the answer to middle class employment 
to black men, women, and people of color who have been locked out of the traditional middle-class job pools. Blacks represent one of the highest unemployment groups in the state of Delaware. And, and I say that because in order to work at the Port of Wilmington since 9-11, you need a TWIC card. A TWIC card is the Transportation Workers Identification Credentials, which allows you to get on any port and, it, and this is nationwide, not just one, but nationwide, the TWIC card is national. And you have to have the TWIC card to work on port facilities, to work on what they consider um, strategic um, job sites like um, power plants and all those kind of things, the railroads, the mass transit, mass transportation systems, you need a TWIC card because they feel that if a terrorist is going to hit something, they want to kill a lot of people, to be blunt, then he's going to bomb one of those places, which is going to create the kind of economic impact to do, to offset America's traditional way of, of, of living, so to speak. The TWIC card creates a, an obstacle in, in a certain sense to us and our ability to supply the workforce for the, for the shipping industry in, in Delaware. You know, um, it creates an, an unnecessary hindrance, I think, to the ability of a, of a guy or a woman who have served their time, have did their time, to then come out of prison and then get a good paying union job or a good paying job to, that can help them um, become and advance into the middle class because everybody should know because history has proven the middle class was built by unions in this country. And right now today, a union job is the best job that a, that a person can have, a working person can have, you know, as it relates to income, as it relates to hospitalization, health and welfare, benefits and those kind of things, you know. And so the problem with the TWIC card is that if someone has a felony, it might be 10 years old and they will be denied their TWIC card which means they'd be denied the opportunity to get a good paying job. Now, a lot of times we can get their TWIC card, but it might take two or three months or more to get that card because there's an appeal process called the process of an appeal and a waiver if you're denied your TWIC card. You know, but this bill, this clean slate bill would wipe that out. It wouldn't be necessary. Someone could come and get it to apply for a job and start working once they fill their application out and approve, can start working the following week. You know, and, and that's a lot. A couple of months without a paycheck versus versus a week, you know, to me can make the difference between someone reverting back to what they used to do because you got to pay them bills, you got babies to feed, you got you got a, a, a rent to pay, you know, you got a, a car note to pay. You know what I'm saying? That can be the difference. Those three to four weeks or those two months. And like a lot of times it takes two months to get them their TWIC card overturned and get their TWIC card. Those two months can make that difference in terms of you understand what I mean. You know, and, and the problem that we're dealing with in Wilmington, for example, in Wilmington alone, the Delaware Workforce Development Board estimates that there are between 6,000 and 8,000 youth between the ages of 18 and 25 that wake up every morning who are not enrolled in any school and do not have a job. Did you hear those numbers? Those numbers should blow your mind that you got six to 8,000 young people in Wilmington working up every morning without a job or, or are not enrolled in school. And you look at that number also. The Wilmington Education Advisory Committee report found that 30% of high school students in Wilmington do not graduate. So that means that out of a thousand high school students in Wilmington, 300 of them don't graduate. And so you can see how this six to 8,000 number finds its, its participants, so to speak, because we got these systems that aren't working and it's putting people out in the streets with no job, no income, no education. And the, work, and, and the best thing for them to do in order to survive is do what? Sell drugs or do some other stuff. 
And so the port has been that answer for those folks who are put in that situation. Because I can name, I'm not gonna name, but there are plenty of men that were 10 years ago, five years ago was on the street slinging, I mean, selling drugs that I knew. But now they got jobs, they're buying homes, they're sending their kids to college because they're working every day at the port because of the, because of the job and, and the port expansion. And so that the clean slate is something we have to support because we have to be against anything that hinders and stops a person who is willing and able, stop them from being able to get employment and get in a good paying job that's gonna help bring them out of poverty. Because, because these conditions and the conditions and those numbers that I read to you, particularly the school numbers, poverty has been the main element there because people are poor. And people are poor gonna do things that they're gonna get in trouble if they can't find a legitimate way to earn a living and, and to pay their bills. And I'm saying the port expansion is gonna create thousands and thousands of new jobs. And so we don't need a quick hindrance to those people who are able and willing to work to be able to come and get some of these jobs at the port. One of the things we've developed to, to accent or to supplement or to help the port expansion is a pro program we developed um, with a group called LEAP, which developed a program called Delaware Pathway to Apprenticeships. You know, and this program is helping to prepare these people that we're talking about to be able to go into the union apprenticeship jobs and pass their apprenticeship test because a lot of them have dropped out of school and they, they're, they're poor in math and in science. And so, and so the, the, the pathway to apprenticeship gives them that kind of education support so they can pass that test because the port expansion is gonna create thousands of construction jobs because the port has to be built. Mm -hmm. Plus it's generating other industries that are coming in just like Amazon you know, in terms of the OGM plant, you know, the port, consideration of the port had a lot to do with that decision. So I'm saying the port expansion is gonna create thousands and thousands of other jobs because industry is gonna to wanna to set up where they can have a port and they can import and export their goods. Okay, I'm, I'm probably going over my limit cause I can go on and on and on. But I wanna thank you guys for this, for this clean slate initiative and the ILA and the unions, we are definitely in 100% support this. Thank you very much. Well, and I wish we could let you go on and on some more because we're getting a ton of positive comments showing how much everyone's appreciating your remarks. Thank you so much, Mr. Harris. And thank you for your um, your support, for your remarks, for ILA's support of Clean Slate, but just such an important and, and really concrete real-time example of why this policy has the potential to remove government-created barriers um, that are, are, are blocking off um, access to employment um, uh, that is the, the cornerstone of, of economic security, let alone upward mobility, as everyone's been speaking about um, in Delaware, but also beyond. Um, so we've got two more speakers to, to bring us home. I'm going to turn it over next to Mike Brickner, who's the um, executive director of ACLU of Delaware, um, uh, leading uh, on this uh, event today. Um, uh, and, and just thank you so much to, um, to you, Mike, and to your entire team, um, including Morgan, who's been just a total powerhouse behind the scenes making today possible. Um, Mike has been advocating for justice-involved folks most of his career, um, including campaigns for systemic reforms to combat contemporary debtors' prisons, um, another uh, important issue we're not talking about today that, that very much intersects with criminal records, as well as uh, jail fees, uh, fighting the use of prisons for profit, solitary confinement, and a whole bunch of, of, of other issues as well. Mike, thank you so much for being here today, um, and I'm going to turn it over to you next. Thanks so much, Rebecca. And yeah, I think the fact that uh, we have such a great team uh, here today, I am uh, humbled and privileged to be able to be here with so many other uh, great folks who have experience, lived experience, experience in policy, experience uh, in the business community. And I'm also very privileged to be able to be here and speak on behalf of the ACLU and the Campaign for Smart Justice as to why we think that Clean Slate is such an important uh, policy change and why we are making it a top priority for our organization. 
uh, you know, we launched the Campaign for Smart Justice back in 2018. And from the outset, we set an ostentatious goal to uh, reduce Delaware's prison population by 50%. Uh, we knew that we had a lot of work to do here in the state of Delaware. If you compare us with all of our other neighbors and most other states here in the Northeast Corridor, we incarcerate people at a higher rate. We have higher racial disparities uh, in our justice system. And so we knew we had a lot of work to do. And from the outset, we prioritized uh, second chances. And so we were one of the uh, leading forces working with Corey, working with Senator Brown uh, to pass the expungement bill back in 2019. And we did that because we know that providing second chances to individuals is it's such an important tool to make our community safer to uh, provide opportunity to, to people and to ensure that folks don't end up back into the justice system. As you heard from so many of our other speakers today, uh, when you come out of prison or just when you get a conviction that maybe you don't even have to serve any prison time for, once you have that conviction, it becomes that scarlet letter that, that Corey talked about where Every single interview you go to, when, it, when you apply for housing, when you look for credit, when you try and get an educational opportunity, you're waiting for that shoe to drop. You're waiting for the fact that you have a criminal conviction to come up. And it, it, it leaves you with this constant sense of anxiety and fear of how you're going to be judged. And it essentially creates what we believe at the ACLU is a, set, uh, is a set of second class citizens, where we are treating people who have criminal convictions as somehow less than. But none of us are, uh, are, 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 should be judged on our worst decision, right? We are all greater than whatever sort of mistake we might have made in the past. And so providing second chances, giving people an opportunity to open a door to housing, to employment, to education, that can be the key to keep people out of the justice system, but to also ensure that we have healthy, thriving communities with people uh, taking advantage of opportunities and helping to build stronger neighborhoods and communities. And so it, it's incredibly important. What Clean Slate does is it takes the work from 2019 and moves it a step further. If you look just here in the state of Delaware, 400, over 400,000 people have some sort of record of arrest or conviction here in the state. Right now, as we're sitting here, over 60,000 people uh, here in Delaware qualify for the expungement process, but have not uh, gotten their record expunged yet. And most of that is due to the fact that the expungement process is really, really difficult to navigate. You oftentimes have to have an attorney or some sort of advocate. You might have to pay money to be able to, to uh, navigate some of the places. And so it becomes really, really difficult for people to get through that bureaucratic maze. And so we have so many folks that could be benefited by this policy where we have automatic record clearing, where you keep yourself out of any kind of criminal trouble, you have no contact with the criminal justice system for a certain period of time, you rehabilitate your life, you don't have to go through this big bureaucratic nightmare, and you can move on with your life. This is a uh, policy that has broad agreement from uh, Republicans, Democrats, independents, business communities, civil rights and civil liberties organizations, this is the next great step that we can take here in the first state to advance our criminal justice system and to ensure that we are truly giving people a second chance and helping to dismantle that system of mass incarceration and racial injustice that has really typified our country and our state for many decades. And so we uh, stand in solidarity with all of the other groups today. We are making this a top priority of our organization. And I'm really happy that we've brought along a lot of wonderful organizations uh, with us and that we're standing with other folks. And the next speaker you're gonna hear from is a representative from one of those organizations, uh, Kaylin Richards, who is the policy coordinator at the Delaware Center for Justice. And 
I just have to say, uh, Kaylin is always a delight to work with. She is tenacious. She is uh, uh, quite funny too, I, I think. Uh, she has a great sense of humor. And um, she is a, an, an amazing policy person. And they do wonderful work at the Delaware Center for Justice, where uh, every day they interact with people in the justice system. And so Kaylin's going to talk to you all a little bit about the work that they do at DCJ, how this will help uh, their uh, clients, and why DCJ is behind Clean Slate. So take it away, Kaylin. Good afternoon, everyone. Mike, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, like Mike said, I work for the Delaware Center for Justice. We are a criminal justice reform nonprofit. Uh, we have a bunch of free direct service programs for justice involved people. And we also do some policy and advocacy work as well. Um, I echo the sentiments of everyone who has spoken before me. This initiative will benefit the entire state of Delaware, but also the country. Um, and I'm not just being overly optimistic when I say that. One thing we're seeing in our expungement work at DCJ are the unique challenges that people who moved out of Delaware but still have a record here, the challenges that they face when seeking expungements because there are extra steps that they will need to take, which often requires more time and money. So for example, someone in Pennsylvania may have to go get their fingerprints done at a Pennsylvania police station. And then those fingerprints will have to be sent to a Delaware police station. And then that's how the process starts. But again, sometimes this requires more time and more money and the process itself discourages people from seeking an expungement at all. And this initiative will make their lives so much easier. Also, DCJ offers a mediation program that allows people to resolve conflicts using mediation opposed to court. And one of the main benefits of our mediation program is that the defendant will have an opportunity for a mandatory expungement once they complete the mediation program because the charges will be dismissed. Um, but then there's an additional step that people have to take in order to be able to fully walk away from their mistake. And that's the expungement piece. Um, and let's just keep in mind here that this person has already come to an agreement with the victim, right, with the, with the person who they've caused harm to and they have already paid their debt to that victim. So now they have to pay in Delaware will be an additional $52 to begin the mandatory expungement process. And not everyone is going to have that money right away. And, the, and that means the pending charges are just sitting on their records. If this person has a job, their employer can, can fire them for having that on their record. Or if they're seeking employment, they can be denied opportunities um, which we see some people just choose to wait to apply to jobs um, until they can get their record cleared because it will increase their chances of getting said job. Um, and, and then just hope and pray that that job is still available and open once their records are clear. Um, and this is just very counterproductive uh, for us as a state. So streamlining, streamlining record clearances in this manner removes barriers that we see our clients face every single day. Um, applying for an expungement may seem like a small step to some, but it could be a major roadblock to someone who just paid restitution and is ready to get back to living a productive life. And last but not least, I just wanna say what I love about automated expungements and this Clean Slate initiative is that it is low hanging fruit and yet it will improve the lives of hundreds and thousands of Delawareans. Um, and former Delawareans who, who live across the country but still have a record here. So again, DCJ is fully on board. We appreciate this effort. And thank you, thank you, thank you to Senator Darius Brown for, for really championing this work from the very beginning. Thank you. Kaylin, thank you so much. And, and Mike, thank you as well. Um, I just, it's such a great note to end on because I think that's exactly right, right? As, as you've heard from everyone, low hanging fruit that will also change hundreds of thousands of lives, which in so many ways is um, kind of the best case scenario for a, a single piece of legislation that can actually get passed in a legislative session and yet make such enormous change. Um, so thank you so much to all of our panelists today, um, uh, to everyone who made this event possible, um, including especially Morgan behind the scenes, the 
the great Morgan of the ACLU of Delaware, um, keeping everyone organized. And thank you so much to everyone for joining um, today uh, to, to hear um, uh, all of our fabulous panelists' remarks. Um, just a quick reminder to media who are, are um, currently participating, there will be a quick uh, media debrief event um, happening just after we uh, conclude the public event. So um, uh, you should have received uh, login instructions for that. And we'll see you over in the media debrief um, if you're here for that. But um, just a, a huge thank you to the ACLU of Delaware, um, to uh, Game Changers, to the Delaware Justice Center, um, to Senator State Senator Darius Brown, uh, Congresswoman Lisa Blount Rochester, the great Reverend, everyone you heard from today. It's an amazing, amazing team. Um, clearly, as you've seen from this event, uh, working to bring Clean Slate to Delaware. Um, and there is just so much to watch in the weeks and months ahead as the legislation gets introduced and starts to advance through the legislature. So um, stay tuned. You should have seen lots in the chat from Morgan as she's been putting things in there, resources to follow, including all of the panelists to, to keep an eye on on Twitter, um, the website for the campaign. Um, and you can, of course, follow hashtag Clean Slate for, update, for updates ongoing. Thanks again for um, taking time out of your Wednesday to join us and sending good wishes to all of you out there in cyberspace. Media, we'll see you in the debrief next. Thanks so much.